Your son, Aikov, Kahime Aro, will on us or in Takulesh on Radam Shah. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to see, see you all here. Um, on behalf of the Ireland Canada University, your University Foundation, can I say what a great, great pleasure it is for us to be supporting this fellowship? I'd just like to say a little bit about, about our foundation. Um, ICUF builds connections between Ireland and Canada. Um, over the past 20 years, we've supported uh, over 500 uh, researchers and learners from Ireland and Canada to travel between both countries. And I'm very happy to say that many of these have come from St. Mary's University to Ireland to study Irish in Kairua. Um, and we've also had scholars uh, travel to St. Mary's. Um, so it's really great to see um, this connection developing through our Beacon uh, Fellowship Program as well. Um, the aim of our foundation is through, uh, a friend, through building friendship between the people of Canada and Ireland to find ways that we can contribute to our society and towards a sustainable planet. And a significant part of quality of life in our society is our language and our culture. And uh, it's exciting to see the subject of this uh, fellowship um, today. So for that reason, could I congratulate on Commissioner Changa Ronan O'Donnell on uh, uh, being a Beacon Fellow. We're delighted that, uh, that you have accepted this award. I would also like to thank you, Porik, and your team in St. Mary's University in coming to us with this proposal for a Beacon Fellowship. Um, the Beacon Programme, this is the first year of the Beacon Programme. Um, we're really excited by uh, the potential um, this program enables connections without, uh, without the use of fossil fuels, which has been a name of ours for, for years, to find ways to build connections without having to always get on a plane. Um, meeting is always going to be important in, in terms of building friendship between our countries, but this program provides a really exciting opportunity to make meaningful connections online that hopefully will in due course lead to people actually meeting and shaking hands. Uh, but for the moment, uh, we're really excited with the opportunity that this program uh, offers. Um, we have uh, maybe about 18 or 20 Beacon Fellowships this year. And like this one, um, all of them are being recorded and they're going to be available on our website. And um, so if you'd like to sign up to uh, find out about some of these other fellowships and to watch, watch them online, um, my colleague Amanda Hopkins, I think, is going to put a note in the chat um, about how you can watch those and I think needing to join our mailing list. Um, okay, uh, as, you, as you know, the, as people know, this is the public lecture element of the programme, but the Beacon programme also enables smaller uh, engagement. And so uh, this will offer um, Porik and his students and colleagues there, the opportunity over coming weeks to uh, meet with Ronan and to talk in greater detail and kind of in a one-to-one -one kind of context or small context where people will get the opportunity to really uh, engage in a conversation. So we're really delighted to be supporting that element as well. Um, I'd like to thank our government, uh, our funders, the Government of Ireland are funding this through the Department of Foreign Affairs Emigrant Support Programme. And we are also funded by Global Affairs Canada, um, uh, who uh, fund the Canadian uh, Beacon Fellowships. Okay, I think that's it from me. Um, I just wish, uh, close by wishing you, wishing you all the very best for this fellowship. We hope that through this lecture and coming events that you will find the opportunity to, real, to build connections and friendships that will help uh, contribute to the great friendship that exists between Ireland and Canada, and also to a more rich and uh, uh, a rich, richer society, um, which we all, I, I think, would agree is a, is a better place to live um, when we have when we support the diversity of language. 
Okay. Shane, Kjappen, Gramil, Mark, Mark at the Rish, Aforic, and I'm back to you. Okay, great, Mike, James. Thank you, James. The Horo Akna Janga of the Gula took a shaking year, in Savli and Gavila said three. Bonu Poston Commissioner Changa, Mar Ofik Nyav Splach, and Wilmer Horamurhi, Sul Hanuler Chli in the Golinan and Stat, Kolakti Publi, August Gleamerk the Board, Jokus Kodjuk the Statch, a Gudge Dogus, a Light Nagarika, Ismar Ofik a Haki in the Cart and Tirani, is a Hosnian Cart and Tirani Hain, a Hudge Gro, Lisha Stat, a Yano and Yelika. With, with the passing into law of the Official Languages Act in Ireland in 2003, the independent office of the Commissioner of and Commissioner Changa was established to monitor compliance by the state, public bodies, agencies, boards and state companies with the Act and to uphold and protect Irish speakers' rights to conduct their business with the state in Irish. Hossi Ronan O'Donnell or Herman Mark Commissioner Changa Sivlian Gavilis or Sakahar Jag Agus e anymna e gwiltas na heran fwefa e gyn eruchtas agus capaha e gwchter na heran. A chiapu sibliyan ga vilas in nijig e de chrefse se bliyana ella. Nominated by the Government of Ireland, approved by Interactus and appointed by the President of Ireland, Ronan O'Donnell became an Commissioner Changa in 2014. He was reappointed in 2019 for a second six-year term. For Gaeltak to Sharon and Donal on Kiarua Agonamara, Hashi Blienta, a play lesson Erishorot, La RTE, Augusti G. Kahar, Agus Vinamer Capu in the Commissioner Changa E, Vishin Horagri Polichul, Ignort RTE T. G. Kahar. Ronan O'Donnell is a Gaeltak man from Kiarua in Connemara. He spent many years as a journalist working with RTE and, and T. G. Kahar. Before his appointment as Commissioner Changa, he was political correspondent with Nocht RTE TG Akahar. Post Duchlanach is Sha Poston Commissioner Changa, Octana Air Donal Ronan O'Donnell, a will Najinchery Eggy, a Hodge Fravor has Sagal Tucked, Achelorter and Gaelica Marhanga Fubble, the skill in the Comrade Comersagic Meshkill, a Hagen Lesh Nablientishin and Arniel, the Hirishorachta. Kuramaheki, Ern Horus Polichul, Agus Aaron Doy, Agasan Rohi, Narachti Yachta Gomal, Maris Leran Villachanga Tuskor, and Erechtish Fuilacher. Ronan O'Donnell's background kind of, of course, one perfectly suited to the challenges of a position such as in Commissioner Changa. He comes from an Irish speaking community, so knowledge of Irish as a living community language. He has communication skills with those years in the media. His knowledge of the workings of the political world and the legislative process, one which is frequently kind of torturously a, 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 a slow process as evidenced by the, the, the language bill, now slowly winding its way through Antirachtus. Taluhar Taylor and Goel Ronan O'Donnell and Commissioner Changa led in you on the Hanyolis or Hersi Kerta Changa in Yering, a rich Lynn. I'm delighted to have Ronan O'Donnell and Commissioner Changa with us here today to share his insights into times past, times to come, 100 years of language rights in Ireland. Where to now? Okay. So, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for logging in. I can see there's a big, uh, big crowd of people logged in, not just members of my own family as well, which have slightly inflated the numbers, but anyway, you're all very welcome. Um, uh, I'm honoured to receive the fellowship. I was, I was thrilled uh, when, when Porik uh, got in contact about it. I would have loved to have been uh, in Halifax delivering this lecture. I'd love to be anywhere, really, I think, <laughs> when we're all locked up at the moment, but... Uh, such is life, and um, but you know, I, I was delighted to receive it. Uh, you know, I view it as a, an acknowledgement of the work we do in our office, which will be uh, twenty years on the go uh, in a few in a few years' time. So I, I was thrilled um, to get this opportunity to speak to you about language rights. Um, can I thank the Irish Can Ireland Canada University Foundation um, for this honour? 
Um, I'm aware firsthand from being from Ikaru of the work they do. You know, it's very important work uh, promoting the language in areas like Ikaru. And I see the effect it has on a small local community when students from abroad come in and uh, are willing to immerse themselves in our culture and our language. You know, it means a lot to people. And long, uh, long may it last. And especially to Porico Shield as well, uh, a scholar and a gentleman. Uh, I was uh, delighted to uh, meet you properly yesterday online and I wish you and all in St Mary's University in Halifax all the best for the years ahead. So what I propose to do guys basically is, um, and it will be difficult because we're doing it remotely and you know it, it's not easy doing things on Zoom all the time, but I'm going to keep it uh, to around 40 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes of looking back on the Irish language and its challenges um, over the past hundred years, a bit, bit further than hundred years back, how there was a revival, attempts at revival at the time in the 1970s in Ireland, how there was a regression again as regards language rights, how that changed again with the Official Languages Act uh, in the 2000s, and how that you know, served a function. And uh, I'd be speaking about the act, its strengths, its weaknesses, and efforts to uh, strengthen it further with um, an, a new language act, which Porik mentioned, which is going through the houses of the Erechthus. So what I'm, I'm going to start further back than 100 years. I'm going to go back to 1891. And basically, the census in that year showed that 680,000 people in Ireland, or 14.5% of the population, could speak Irish. Most of these were native Irish speakers who lived in the west or south of the country where Irish was or had been until recently the community languages. Now that's a world away um, from today's Gaeltacht, but it represented just the remnants of destruction because Irish was, was retreating towards the west from the beginning of the 19th century. But after the famine in the middle of the, that century, this retreat turned into a collapse. And it's an amazing statistic. The number of Irish speakers fell by 86% in 50 years. And in addition to that, if the number of young people with Irish is observed, it's clear that the language shift had already taken hold in many places where there was a high number of Irish speakers and that Irish was spoken by the older generations only. Now, many reasons are cited for that shift that occurred in Ireland. And of course, they all played a part in what happened but what they share is the power imbalance between the stronger language and the minority language. And that's the general theme, I think, that's going to run through this uh, lecture, the, 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 the imbalance between the stronger language and the minority language, and how can the language that was spoken by the minority make itself heard and, and grasp a foothold uh, in society and in dealings with the state. And what tends to happen is that people perceive that their native language is insufficient for their employment, educational, social or communication needs, and that second language learning is essential for their success and even their survival. The situation of minority language speakers has to be understood in the context of the power and the functional inequality between the stronger language and the minority language. This involves circumstantial bilingualism and the result, more often than not, is a shift of language to the stronger language. And I don't think that's going to come as a, a surprise to anyone. In Ireland, the impact of the state and the institutions of the state on people's lives was instrumental in that process and in the shift from English to Irish. So at the beginning of the 19th century, the state had little to do with the lives of ordinary people, but gradually the role of the state in people's lives expanded and education provided opportunity for progression an employment prospect existed in the public service. Speaking and writing in English was necessary to take advantage of these opportunities. And Irish very often was viewed as superfluous. So it's fair to say that the administrative language of the state was one of the causes of the language shift. So efforts were made to fight this tide basically. And Conrad na Gaelge, the Gaelic League was established as a response to the emergency. Unlike the previous Society for the Preservation of the Irish Language, Conan O'Gregor succeeded in capturing the imagination of the general public and established itself as a mass movement. And it numbered 100,000 members and 900 branches uh, when it was at its peak. So cultural nationalism had come strongly to the fore by that time. 
and cultural and linguistic particularity was imagined as a sign of the distinctiveness and identity of a nation with the right of self-determination. So although the entire Irish language movement didn't favor linking it with the political movement, nevertheless, the Irish language did form part of the ideals of the political and military movement that achieved political freedom for most of the country. The majority of the signatories of the proclamation of the Republic were Irish speakers and members of Cumann na Gaeilge, and the proceedings of the first meeting of Dáil Éireann in 1929, the Irish Parliament, they were held in Irish. And the leaders of the new free state adopted the doctrine of Cumann na Gaeilge and accepted that the revival of Irish was an intrinsic part of the national project. And they made Irish the national language in the free state constitution at a time when only 18% of the state's population could speak it, with the percentage actively speaking it even lower. So Porrick O'Regan, an academic, outlined four key elements of the state's strategy for Irish at that time. Protecting and sustaining Irish in the districts where it was spoken, increasing the number of Irish speakers uh, to, to the schools, promoting it in the public service, and standardizing the language as well. And then in relation to the Gaeltacht, the Gaeltacht Commission identified in 1926 that Irish as a community language was declining as rapidly as had been the case under British rule. And it's noteworthy, I think, that the Commission identified the adverse effect on the use of Irish in the Gaeltacht by public servants with no proficiency in the language and by providing public services through English only. So affirmation was given to the necessity for Irish to be the default language between the state and its officials and the people of the Gaeltacht and for public servants working in the Gaeltacht to be Irish speak. And this, this is amazing, this quote. Right? This is from 1926 from the Gaeltacht Commission and it's still relevant. You know, there's a, I'll come back to it later, but there's a debate going on to an official language at the moment, as I said, and this is the crux of that debate or a central element to it is what is the state willing to commit to as regards services in the Gaeltacht. And so 1926, the, the commission said, in order to fully understand it, one only has to visualize a Garda Shikhana barracks of English speaking Gardaí in the center of an Irish speaking district, or a post office in which no one speaks Irish in an Irish speaking village, or a non Irish speaking official of the Department of Agriculture, or of the Land, Land Commission, or the Customs and Excise operating amongst an Irish speaking population. These officials are direct agents in the spreading and establishment of English. So I think if we're going to look at the question of Irish and the state, we, we need to look also at the constitution. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the Irish is confirmed as the national language in Article 4 of the Constitution of the Free State. But in the Constitution of Ireland in 1937, which, which, we, we, which is still uh, the, the, the constitution we have here, that, con that article confirms Irish as the national language, and as the first official language. So there's been, a, there's been a move from the previous constitution to the 1937 one, which recognised the language also as the first official language, where English is recognised as the second official language. And the revised wording suggests that the constitutional status of the Irish language in the constitution was enhanced and it's a view consistent with the judgment given by Justice O'Hanlon, who said, I believe that the provisions of Article 8 of the Irish constitution are stronger on the recognition of Irish as the first official language of the state than was the case in Article 4 of the constitution of the free state. Now, a full separate lecture could be given on the interpretation of the High Court and Supreme Court judges on the meaning of this provision of the Constitution. There have been many over the years, but it's worth highlighting Judge Adrian Hardyman's judgment in the Supreme Court in 2001, as it's consistent, I believe, with the meaning or understanding we would have of the words first official language, where he said, in my opinion, Irish, being the national language and at the same time being the first official language of the state cannot be excluded from any part of the public discourse of the nation or from any official business of the state or of any of its constituent parts, nor can it be treated in these contexts in any way that is less favorable 
than the way in which the second official language is treated, nor can those who are competent in the language and wish to use it to express themselves or to communicate be prevented or disadvantaged in doing so in any national or official context. So that's all well and good, but it's important, however, to pay attention to a subsequent important judgment of the Supreme Court. And this is an interesting case. In this case, there was a defendant, a native Irish speaker from the Gaeltacht, and he claimed that he had the right not only to make his case in the court in the first official language, uh, Irish, but that he was also entitled to a jury capable of hearing his case without an interpreter or translation into English. So this claim then was rejected by the High Court and the Supreme Court confirmed the High Court judgment in a majority decision. The enrolment of juror that said, with the ability to understand the case in Irish would amount to an exclusion of a significant portion of society as a whole. And a jury, it said, should be representative of society as a whole. So we can turn to Hardyman again, and he gave the dissenting judgment in this, and he said that there could be no other country on earth where a citizen would not be entitled to conduct his or her business before a court in the national language and in the first official language of that country and to be understood directly by the court in that language. So questions arise from this, basically. Now, can it be understood now that the state's obligations and the rights of citizens rely on the relative number of Irish speakers and English speakers in the population at any given time. And Judge Frank Clark in that case said, while the state and each of its organs has an obligation to promote and respect the high status of the Irish language, there may nonetheless be limitations on an entitlement to have Irish used, which derive from the limited use of Irish in ordinary everyday life, at least, so far as many parts of the country is concerned. So I'm going to turn guys briefly then to my own functions as uh, Commissioner Tsanga. And they include launching an investigation on my own initiative or in foot of a complaint to ascertain whether any provision or enactment relation to the use of an official language was not or is not being complied with. This refers to statutory provisions that are neither contained in the Official Languages Act nor come under the Act itself. Some of these were minor or symbolic provisions made for Irish, and of course, some of them are no longer in force. These statutory provisions contained in pieces of legislation were studied by Dr. John Walsh, and he identified 197 different sections in separate legis different pieces of legislation relating to Irish language obligations, distinct from the Official Languages Act itself. And for the most part, these provisions, I argue, mirror the lack of clarity in the state's policy for Irish and importance of the policy. So it would be expected in a bilingual jurisdiction with planning objectives, language planning objectives and policy, that both those legislative provisions and the legislative corpus would be more consistent and substantial. But many of the provisions are general, are, con are they're conditional, and it's difficult to identify the action or activity they're supposed to fulfill. And it's even more difficult as language commissioner to identify with any certainty where they have been breached. That said, there are a number of enactments containing substantive language provisions, and these are most commonly the subject of complaints investigated my office to, by my office, which are not part of the Official Languages Act. These include the Education Act, 1998, uh, the Planning and Development Act, the Natural, National Cultural Institutions Act, the Transport Act, the Road Traffic Act, and so on. The Road Traffic Act and Transport Act relate to uh, signage, for example, and they greatly enhance the visibility and the status of Irish uh, in the eyes of the general public. Regarding the administrative system, and if we get, come back to where I started in, in the late uh, 1800s and people viewing Irish as not being uh, relative to their lives and getting on and getting jobs in the public service. So in the administrative system, when the new state uh, was established, and then it was viewed that this was something that should be tackled. And from 1925, uh, the Irish language was a required subject in open competitions for general civil service grades. And other steps were subsequently taken to increase the amount of civil servants uh, with Irish. 
1945, for example, a competency test in Irish was conducted for promotion. And it's clear it worked. You know, th these efforts succeeded over time in enhancing the ability of civil service uh, in the Irish language. But what wasn't done, and this is the crux of it really as regards the civil service and Irish, I think, what wasn't done was the implementation of measures for that competence to be utilised. So civil servants were obliged to maintain and improve their Irish, uh, it's, especially if they wanted to get promoted, even if that skill had no function in their normal work practice and despite not having opportunities to use Irish. And this, you know, it probably did. It may have resulted in a certain amount of resentment and, and cynicism. And what was missing basically was planning with clear goals for the use of Irish internally and for the provision of services to citizens. And also necessary was legislation to ensure in practice the rights of citizens to carry out their business with the state through Irish. The Irish language entry was ended then in 1975 and that was replaced by the ability to function in both languages being given a certain advantage in promotion competitions and there's no doubt basically, but that the Irish language capacity of state departments and the public service in general declined substantially uh, after that. And that decision uh, in 1975 needs to be understood. And I mentioned this at the start from the 1970s on. It needs to be understood in the context of its time because a change can be seen from 1970 in the attitudes and the policies of the state in relation to Irish and its retreat from Irish, the, the ending of the Irish as an entry requirement for the civil service being the most obvious sign. Porrick O'Regan, uh, who I mentioned earlier, had, had a great phrase, he called it benign neglect, is how he summarised the state's attitude to Irish. The life of the country at the time was changing dramatically, there was economic and social development, um, the economic, political and cultural relationship with the wider English-speaking world grew considerably in tandem with membership of the EEC, the European Community, 1973. And the country was integrating globally as well with international capitalism. And it was assumed that Ireland was an English speaking country and will continue to be so. And in the words of Martin O'Murrahu, if some citizens had benefited from an interest in the Irish language, it is now deemed to be a private optional interest, scarcely a public interest, in which the state is perceived to have an active obligation to promote. And this is most obvious in the education sector. Since the establishment of the state, most of the pressure to increase the number of primary schools teaching true Irish came from the state itself. It's the opposite of what's happening now where it's coming from the communities. So it came from the state itself. And by 1950, approximately half the primary schools in the country were teaching this way. But later they disappeared, and this is another lovely phrase by Sean O'Reilly, they disappeared in those core law Mahon, he said, like the foam on the river. And by 1976, there were only 20 Irish medium primary schools outside the Grail Club. So it's an amazing decline. And since then, the promotion of Irish medium schools has been promoted from the grassroots with apathy or hostility on the part of the state being detected. That said, uh, I, I, I would argue also that there has been some new and positive developments in this area um, as well, which I'll return to later. But I believe that when those concerns, so if we would try and transport ourselves back to the 70s when this, when this was happening, when the education was getting harder to get through Irish outside the Grail, when it was being... Um, not made pre-requirement for the civil service, when less and less people were, were speaking it. So it's, it's around that time, I believe, that when those concerned with the welfare and the viability of Irish realised that they were on different trajectories with the state, it was only then that the discourse in those circles concerning language rights and equality began to develop. Now, some of this was probably under the influence of the civil rights movement of the 60s, it was felt that the state had to be confronted to achieve objectives concerning the welfare of Irish. Rights were demanded, protests were held, protests were held, and this is seen in the Gaeltacht civil rights movement. It's seen in the establishment of Radio Nagaeltacht in 1972, Uderos Nagaeltacht in 1980, 
the Campaign for Television Service and for an Irish Language Act. And it's noteworthy that in the 2002 Gaeltacht Commission report, this is the second Gaeltacht Commission report, we had the 1926 one, which we mentioned earlier. And, and in 2002, there was an, another Gaeltacht Commission report. And that basically said that the Gaeltacht was not viable in the absence of state policy in relation to Irish, and that no such policy was known to exist. You know, it's brutal words really from a, a, a commission uh, uh, that rang true. No such policy was known to exist, it said. And a number of significant recommendations were made in the report, which began the process of moving the state on from its aimlessness in relation to Irish language and wealth of policy. It was recommended that the state make a policy of revitalizing Irish as a national language. And in 2006, the Irish government published the statement on the Irish language in which the government declared its support for the development and preservation of the Irish language on the Gaeltacht, and that the objective of government policy in relation to Irish is to increase on an incremental basis the use and knowledge of Irish as a community language. The report also recommended the development of a national plan for the Irish language with clear objectives, and the government subsequently published the 20-year strategy for Irish in 2010. The strategy has attracted much comment from Irish speakers about its content and its implementation or lack of uh, in the intervening years. A further recommendation in the report of the Great Commission was an act to ensure the equality of official languages and the rights of citizens to achieve services through Irish and to appoint a language commissioner for these purposes. And before moving on, it's worth mentioning for the sake of completeness, the comprehensive linguistic study on the use of Irish published in 2007, which highlighted starkly the severe challenges facing the Irish language in the Great That was the same year that Irish became an official language in the European Union. And the Gaeltacht Act was enacted in 2012, which in essence divided the Gaeltacht into separate language planning areas. So my own function as Commissioner of Tanga, they're closely related obviously to the Official Languages Act. And the general objectives of that act are to promote the use of Irish language for official purposes in the state, to set out, public, to set out duties of public bodies in respect of the official languages, and to establish the office of um, Commissioner of Tanga. And what's surprising is that the Act focuses on the duties of public bodies in respect of the official languages more than the rights of citizens. In summary, the rights of people to use their official language of choice in the courts and in the houses of the Erethus are confirmed in part two. Part three deals with language obligations of public bodies, including provisions of the Act itself, regulations and language schemes. Part four concerns the functions and powers of the Commissioner at Tsanga, and part five deals with Gaeltacht place names and other place names. So the Act places certain obligations on state bodies, mainly regarding the provision of information. So it relates to written communications, certain publications, signs, stationery, and so on. And it was accepted, it's quite clear looking at the Act, it was accepted that public bodies would not be able to or could not afford basically to provide all their services equally in both languages in one go. And to, to challenge that, I suppose, or to try to rectify that, the system of language schemes was introduced to achieve that goal on a phase basis. So the idea was that a three-year language scheme would be approved and specific targets would be identified a second language scheme would build on the achievements of the first scheme, and the public body over time would be able to provide all its services in Irish at the same standards as English. And the system of schemes, therefore, is, is, is forms the essence of the Act's approach. And I'll return later to how that system has, has failed. Um, my functions as Commissioner at Tanga include monitoring the compliance of public bodies with language obligations, and I also advise them in relation to their obligations. And I advise members of the public, and I also investigate alleged breaches of language legislation. And that really is the, the main part of the work we do, you know, investigating complaints um, from the public. You know, they're, they're right to us, and we, we it's like an ombudsman's office. That really is the, the main part of our work. So I'm going to take a brief 
diversion here away from the general talk about uh, the legislation and where we, how we got to the legislation and so on, to focus on some of the investigations we have conducted over the years. Um, so I've chosen three investigations. I'll speak briefly about the three of them. And to give you, the, the idea is it'll give you uh, an idea, I hope, of the work we do, but also um, the arguments that public bodies can make to us sometimes as regarding their, their obligation and duties and how that jars sometimes with the stated aim of the state as regards uh, the Irish language. So the first one I'm going to look at is the Office of the Revenue Commissioners. So under the Official Languages Act, um, under Section 28 of that Act, a finding or a recommendation made by the Language Commissioner can be challenged in the High Court. And no appeal has ever uh, was ever made except by the Revenue Commissioners in 2013. And that was heard in 2014. So that related basically to Section 9.3 of the Official Languages Act. And that says if a public body communicates in writing with the public, that communication must be in Irish or in Irish and English. So if you're communicating with the public, furnishing them with information, basically it has to be in Irish or Irish and English. That's what the, what the law says, the Official Languages Act says. So a number of complaints were received, were made to the first commissioner, Tango Sean O'Curran, when an information booklet on the local property tax was distributed to almost 1.7 million people. The booklet was in English only for most customers, except those who had registered with the Revenue Commissioner for service through Irish, and they received an Irish language version. So the booklet was an addition. So people got the booklet outlining information about the property tax, and they also received correspondence that were particular to each individual taxpayer. So the investigation carried out by Sean, my predecessor, showed that the Office of the Revenue Commissioners had breached the statutory obligation in relation to the information booklet, but there, were no, there was no breach regarding the rest of the correspondence that came with it. So the Revenue Commissioners then basically argued that the booklet was not issued as a communication under 9.3 of the Act. It wasn't a communication, but it was secondary to the letter and the property tax return issued to individuals, which contained specific personal information, and that the envelope and its contents, contents should be viewed in their entirety as confidential correspondence with individual taxpayers. So basically revenue said, here's an envelope, there's a letter in it, there's a property tax return in it, and there's a booklet about information about the property tax. The Commissioner Tsanga ruled the letter and the property tax return by law didn't have to be available in Irish, but that the booklet was quite clear in the, in the legislation was furnishing information and that that should be uh, in Irish. So revenue argued, no, the three things are one piece of correspondence basically, and that it, it, it didn't have to be in Irish. So thankfully, in a judgment given in the High Court in February, 2015, the appeal by revenue uh, was dismissed and it was a great relief for me because it strongly affirmed the statutory obligations that information dissemination to the public must be in Irish and or, or Irish and English. The second one I'm going to focus on is air code. So we have a postcode system in Ireland called air code. This was uh, brought in in 2015. And the approach taken to the delivery of this resulted in the highest ever number of complaints received by my office about one individual topic. Now, I... I don't think anybody would. I wasn't surprised by the anger felt by people when they received the, the air code, postcode. People received letters with a translation of their name into English when they'd only ever used their name in Irish. Irish language and Gaeltacht place names were spelled inaccurately or translated into English. And basically it all highlighted again that the state finds it difficult to deal with communities and individuals in any language except the default language of officialdom, which is English. Responsibility in this matter rested with the Department of Communications and they had made a commitment in their language scheme that the official Irish versions of Gaeltacht place names as specified in the place names orders would be used. It's slightly complicated because a contractor was undertaking the work, not the department directly, but under the act, a service provided directly or indirectly by a public body uh, is encompassed when such a service is specified in a language scheme. So the investigation showed that the department had contravened the act 
because the commitment in relation to Gaeltach place names had not been met. However, there, I couldn't make a finding that the people's names being translated into English are place names outside the Gaeltach where people had used their address in Irish, that the air code was in English, that that was in breach of the Official Languages Act. And so that was that was a, a big investigation for us because some one's name and surname and address it's an integral part of one's identity, and no person or organisation should take it upon themselves to anglicise this. So in these and other cases, it could hardly be said that language obligations are the realisation of state policies on widening bilingualism, as enunciated in the statement of Irish language and the twenty year strategy for the Irish language were primary considerations of state agents. And it's fair to surmise, in my opinion, that what happens sometimes in the examples I, I have given, that very often they resort to minute technical arguments to defend their position rather than identifying what's best for the language. The third one I'm going to briefly mention before I return to the conclusion of the lecture. The third one I'm going to mention is RTE. So this is the national broadcaster in Ireland. So an investigation showed that the broadcaster breached the Broadcasting Act, which requires it to broadcast a comprehensive range of programmes in Irish. RTE argued when we investigated this on foot of a complaint that they were fulfilling this commitment. So when we went into the, the investigation and we, we, we saw facts and figures and, and percentages and so on, what ultimately showed after various questions, we got to the crux of the matter, which showed that roughly, roughly, 1% of programming on RTE's television schedules were in Irish only. And RTE argued that that constituted a comprehensive range of programs as the legislation required. So that's where we were with, with, with that investigation. And I made a finding that this wasn't comprehensive, but in, you know, by any rational read of the legislation, it wasn't comprehensive. And RTE, to be fair to them, are implementing a plan which is substantially increasing the amount of programmes in Irish on their, on their TV channels from just over 100 hours to roughly five to 600 hours uh, this year. So it's an improvement. It's still, I believe, well below where there should be. And uh, I haven't been able to say as of yet that they are adhering to the Broadcasting Act, though it should be acknowledged also that there has been that uh, aforementioned improvement. So I think in general, it's fair to say that some progress has been made regarding the provision of information and state services by virtue of the act. But as we look back almost 20 years um, from the, since the act came into being, it's fair to say it hasn't delivered as promised. The language schemes are the main mechanism under the legislation to improve the number, range and standard of services that public bodies require in Irish. And in recent years, the quality of the schemes have been poor. And a few years back, I asked my officials to do a comprehensive analysis of our schemes. And we're a very small office. Um, and we had to you know, set aside staff members and time to do this work, but it was, it was very important work because it was an in-depth, deep dive analysis, basically, of language schemes that had been agreed over a period of years. And what it showed really, it confirmed what we knew, but it, it gave it a scientific basis. Basically said that the schemes essentially, in some cases were being used, not as a mechanism to increase the number of services through Irish, but as a, as a way to limit, limit the services. So often wording was used, which meant there was no strict obligation to provide services in Irish. And even if it was intended to implement the system of language schemes in the manner originally envisaged in, in society nowadays, not all public bodies are independent fiefdoms with which an agreement can be concluded without regard to their web of relationships with other parties. And my argument, in my view, and it's accepted now basically, is that the implementation of the state's policy to provide state services in both official languages has to be tackled at a higher level than that of individual public bodies. So basically, instead of language schemes for each body, there should be a set of language standards for various categories of, of, of the public sector. But what's also clear, separate to the language schemes, at the core of the problem, basically, in Ireland, and you know, it's quite simple, really, is that organisations haven't enough staff or any staff with competence in Irish. 
So the bottom line is that services can't be provided, cannot be provided in the language unless the provider of such services is competent in that language. So that need and that deficit must be identified in terms of the Irish language proficiency of staff in the different sectors of the public service. And provision has to be made in recruitment policies and strategies for closing those gaps, including clear targets and timescales for, tar for meeting those targets. Which brings us neatly to the talk about the bill to amend the Official Languages Act. And that's at committee stage in the ERUC that's at present. And this might be the state's final opportunity to put in place an appropriate, fit for purpose and comprehensive system to address the shortfall in the number of people competent in Irish in the civil and public service. I broadly welcome the heads of the new bill, although I highlighted shortcomings in certain areas. A stated objective in the bill is that 20% of new recruits to the public service are to be Irish speakers. It is stated that this will be achieved in the long run. However, a specific target needs to be attached to that objective. And those of us wishing to conduct our business with the state through Irish need to feel confident that this target will be achieved. So a system needs to be established to ensure that a minimum percentage of staff competent at Irish is recruited, that this competency assessment is standardised and that the system is independently monitored. The system has to be based on effective planning and accurate and information and analysis by which the state identifies its priority services, the arrangements to provide such services and the human resources required to achieve this objective. It's all doable, you know, but it takes planning, it takes thought, it takes sitting down and, and, and figuring out where we are, what we need to do to bridge that gap and where we want to get to. And it can be done, you know, with willingness, cooperation, it can be done. I believe that truly, but time is passing. The third thing about the act that I should mention is that it's very important. And this goes back to where I started with the Great Commission in 1926 and where, where they wrote about the idea of having a barracks with English speaking Gardaí and the Great and the effect of that and state agents being agents of English. You know, so a clear prin principle has to be laid down in the Act that state officials based in the Great are providing services there would be fluent in Irish. So over 90 years have passed, as I said, since the Great Commission first identified this. So when the resolution of this was left to the language scheme system, it was put on the long finger. And as I mentioned earlier, the Great areas are language planning areas in accordance with the Great Act. And the aim is to increase the use of Irish language in family, educational, public, social, recreational and commercial life. But there's little point in discussing language planning if the state is unwilling to do its bit in providing its own services through Irish in the Great On its own, the provision of state services through Irish will not solve the linguistic challenges facing the Great but it would reflect determination and leadership, and these are badly needed, because the matter of most concern has to be and is the future of the Gaeltha. Since Reg Hendley published his famous book in 1990, The Death of the Irish Language, researchers have pointed out that the Gaeltha community is in crisis regarding the role of Irish as the everyday community language, and that the Gaeltha as commonly understood would not survive for much longer. The statistics from the latest census show that there is no escaping this truth. Research has also shown that parents, even in the strongest Gaeltacht areas, are finding it increasingly difficult to transmit Irish to their family as a first language in the circumstances in which they live today. In the words of linguist Sylvina Montreux, to summarise, bilingual children who speak a minority language at home become aware very early in life of the political and social status of the language they speak. Once they start to socialize beyond the home through childcare, friends and other social interactions. Even when children are encouraged to use the minority language at home, preference for the majority language is very strong. When the family language is used less frequently than the majority language by simultaneous bilingual children, it runs the risk of becoming weaker 
eventually affecting its vocabulary and grammar. So undoubtedly, the language planning process in the Grail Cup is faced with significant challenges. One positive development has been the publication of the policy on Grail Cup education. This was a major step forward with the exceptional circumstances and the very complex language conditions in the Grail Cup being faced up to. Every single aspect of a person's personal or interpersonal life affects that person's linguistic behavior and ability. And this means that the different aspects of the language planning questions are limitless. And I will remain for my conclusion on my own turf as Commissioner Tanga. The former Welsh language commissioner, Mary Hughes, addressed a parliamentary commission in Ireland where she expressed the opinion that it is dangerous to leave the language in a policy silo. If one sees the language as something which is absolutely discreet and it is dealt with solely as such, there is danger. That approach gives status, status to the language, but it also means that as one plans for economic, social, employment, education and health policy, it sits outside the debate. And from my own experience as Commissioner Tanga, I fear that the Irish language is often omitted from major state policies and from the implementation of these policies. There are people who are brought up through Irish or who take on an identity as Irish speakers, wishing to use Irish as much as possible in their daily lives. The stated aim of the state is to dramatically increase this linguistic community. These people, of course, we live in the same society as the majority who do not speak the language, therefore a living space, a breathing space, must be created for that community within society. When the Irish language is disregarded in the state's policies and activities, the functionality of Irish as a person's language of choice could be adversely affected, and the state's objective could even be thwarted, even if it isn't deliberate. So if a citizen chooses to use Irish, this option should be con as convenient as possible, and that person should not be disadvantaged in any way by making that choice, particularly in any area influenced by the state. That is the least that is required. So since our attention, and I spent a lot of time talking about the difficulties and omissions, in conclusion, finally, I'm going to look back at what has been achieved. So I suspect that not many in the 19th century would believe that Irish would be a living language in the 21st century or that it would be a community language in any part of the country. Almost 1.7 million or 40% of the population claim to have some ability to speak the language. And one third of these or 17% of the entire population indicate that they speak Irish, thanks mainly to the education system, even if this is infrequent in many cases. Irish is a modern language. It's adapted for use in any area of life, high or low. In addition, it enjoys status under national law and European law in the broadcasting and print media, in the education system and in the life of the country generally, being the envy of much larger language communities. These feats are remarkable, they're miraculous, and the state itself was central at times to their achievement. Research has shown that the goodwill of our, the goodwill of Irish society as a whole towards the Irish language. And the space and the circumstances in which Irish can survive or flourish as a living language will be created with the support and the cooperation of the wider community. Ireland's a liberal democracy and has become largely mature. We are proud of this and with good reason. We greatly value the richness of our society in terms of its diversity, inclusivity and compassion. If these values are important to us, the discussion about Irish will have to be framed in the terms of these values. In the context of such a discourse, the public will have the opportunity to give a fairer hearing to the needs and requirements of the Irish language and Grail Talks communities, that we all benefit from Irish being a living language, and that all of us in Ireland and across the world will be diminished by the native language of this island not being spoken anymore. It needs to be widely understood that Irish is a living language and that society should provide for and create space for the language so that people quite simply can speak it amongst themselves and with the state.
Shani. Good Mahavi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronan. So we'll just let you kind of get a little drop of water there and uh, and we'll sort of line up a few uh, questions. I invite people uh, on using the chat feature to, uh, <clears throat> to submit questions. And again, I'll just kind of wait for one or two kind of to, to, uh, to come in there. But can we just go back to the 1970s? And I think you know where I'm going with this, this decision by the then government to end Irish as a requirement in the civil service, the public service. We have been living with the, the, the repercussions of that since in so many different ways. And as you say, kind of uh, the, the, the first language bill there didn't really kind of deal with it. This one is attempting to deal with it but uh, it was an awful, I can probably, I can say this, you probably can't. It was an awful, stupid decision. I, 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 I'd agree with this, to be honest. You know, I, 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 I'm happy to, to, to say that. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's widely accepted now that the, 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 the amount of Irish speakers in the, in the civil service is, is, is but certainly most Irish speakers is accepted as way too low. Um, we can see it uh, at a, we can see it ourselves in the office when we investigate complaints that people who came in first uh, to the civil service in the 70s are starting to retire now, who came in under the, uh, the previous obligation to have Irish, they're starting to retire. And we can see that the people coming through from after that time, you know, haven't the ability basically a lot of time to, to to deal with our office um, through Irish. We did, the, the, we did uh, some work on this and the online newspaper tourist.ie did a lot of work on it also, where it looked at the amount of Irish speakers in, in, in various um, government departments. And it also looked, and we also looked at the uh, amount of posts that were identified in government departments with the requirement that Irish, uh, that people have Irish. And the numbers were like shocking, basically. Do you know, we're, uh, we're looking at like out of a total cohort of um, 30, roughly now, these are rough figures, but roughly say 30, 25, 30,000 civil servants, um, the amount of posts identified with an Irish language requirement was around 87, something like that. Uh, you know, and the majority of those were in the Department of the Guelta. Foreign Affairs had a good few. And then a lot of departments, you know, had one or two posts identified where Irish was a requirement. And if you look at the general figures of people who say they speak Irish as well, not just posts that are required, those figures are quite low as well. You know, they're, they're really down into the, the, the hundreds overall, I think, rather than thousands. So, um, you know, you can see the effect of a, a decision taken 40, 50 years ago, how that can, that can filter through to, to the position we're in today. And what it means basically is that, you know, the state can have, as I said, in the 20 year strategy of the Irish language and its statement on the Irish, it can have these really great ideals and uh, aims to increase the use of Irish that, that should be applauded but you know they can't be delivered upon if there aren't people there to do it. You know it's it's really beneath all the talk and all everything. You know at the end of the day, um, you know if people aren't there with Irish, it's it's it's, it's going to be impossible to provide the service. So that that's uh, where we are, and that's um, why it is so important that if we are to tackle the problems, that three main areas I see basically are the to disband the language schemes bring in standardized system, you know, to have a provision as regards service in the Gael where the problem is critical and in crisis. And as regards the civil and public service, you know, to, to increase substantially uh, the amount of people who speak Irish there. So the two kind of related or two halves to your question there from Derek Collinsworth and, and in a way kind of it fits in with what you're, you're talking about, but from a different angle. Do more Irish speakers need to ask for state services in Irish in order to demonstrate the demand for these services? 
And again, the second part, I've heard anecdotally that many Irish speakers avoid asking for service in Irish due to delays waiting for an Irish speaker, etc. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely that happens. You know, there's the old uh, the old saying, you know, the Irish speakers on holidays. You know, people are used to that when they ring up looking for a service. That the, the, it, it it shows. Um, I think it shows a disconnect uh, between what the act the act at present, what it does, and it, like when the act came into being, basically it was a revolutionary act. You know, it, it really was. You know, it was the first time that there was legislative provision made for Irish language services, and it has to be recognised um, for that. But it's right and it's proper you know, 20 years on that it be revised and it sh should have happened sooner. But under the Act, um, recorded oral announcements uh, have to be in Irish. So if you ring up a, a state body or an agency in Ireland under the Official Languages Act, um, you know, you should hear, if there's a recorded message, it should be bilingual and usually is. But that gives the uh, impression to somebody ringing up then. So they have a recorded message in Irish and you press this button to hear the recorded message. Or can, that gives the impression, the natural understanding to people where they can get the service through Irish. But what, but what an effect it actually means is you can hear the recorded message in Irish. But then if you press a button to get the service, the chances of getting that service through Irish from a person on the other end of the phone is, is very, very low in most organisations. So that's kind of that shows that the the, the 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 act was positive in many ways, but it needed another layer of having people behind it as well to ensure that the service was there. Um, so as regards Irish speakers asking for services in Irish, uh, absolutely people should. But like, you know, people are busy as well, and people people are there's definitely an element of you know, people feeling, well, you know, I just want to get my, my driver license. I just want to get this form done. I just want to get it done as quick as I can. And there is, and, I, and that's completely understandable. I, I think my view is that if people were aware and people knew and people had confidence that a service was there, that demand would stem from that. So we often, when I'm meeting, um, you know, heads of public bodies and stuff talking about, legislation and the requirement for for stronger legislation very often i'm told look there's no demand there you know there's no there's no demand we have a phone line for irish speakers nobody rings it etc and you know it's not it's not right and it's not fair and it's not true because you can't expect someone to uh avail of a service in irish if it's a second rate service if it's not the same if it's not as good as the service in english why should you expect people to use it so if you have to ring and ask for um, uh, an Irish speaker to, to, to help you with what you want, what, 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 whatever your business is. If you're told, well, you know, um, somebody will ring you back tomorrow or somebody will ring you back later, um, or if you're told it'll be later in the week, or if you're told there's no one available, you know, why should you try, why should you, you know, why should you look for that service continually if you can, be, if you can do it easier to English? So basically my, my argument is if you provide the service as easy as you provide the service in English, that people will use that. And I think, uh, I think it might have been Eamon O'Keefe that said it in, a, in, a, in the doll, like that, you know, when he's, so he knows when he rings the Department of the Gaeltacht that he can get service through Irish. So he speaks Irish because he knows he can get it. So I think if people knew they could get a service through Irish, um, that they would use it more, more than they do at present. But unfortunately, and until the, the issue of recruitment of the public and civil service is addressed, it's going to be difficult to do that. You, you mentioned the number of complaints through the air code sort of uh, uh, situation. How many complaints per year does your office yeah. deal with? And how, how has that changed over the years? Uh, it, it's, it, we get roughly around 700. And what the, there's, there's um, where, where that has changed is that slightly changed, but roughly half of it was roughly below half, and now it's roughly above half. Half of those complaints I can't investigate because 
uh, to investigate a complaint, I have to be of the view that there a piece of legislation regarding the Irish language may have been breached. So I get a complaint from someone who says, um, you know, I walked into the county council in Kilkenny and the person behind the desk couldn't uh, speak to me in Irish and they couldn't provide uh, anyone with me in the planning department uh, with Irish. So what we do in that situation, we look at the Languages Act, there's nothing in the Languages Act that says local authorities have to have face-to-face -face interaction with people through Irish. So then we look at their language scheme and I've addressed how that has been discredited and there's very little in a lot of the language schemes. So then we have to go back to the complainant and say, you know, thank you for your complaint, but unfortunately, there's nothing in the legislation that requires the local authority or the public body, whatever it is in those circumstances, to provide that service in Irish, so we can't investigate it. And that's uh, troubling, you know, and it's worrying, and it's something that concerns me as Commissioner Tsonga, um, that I'm left in that position where I have to go back to people a lot of the time, half the time, over half the time, and say, I can't investigate your complaint because there is a breach or a perceived breach of legislation. Um, so that's uh, a big area. The, 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 of the remaining, say, three, 350 complaints, you know, it spreads right across the act. It could be anything from signage to stationery to recorded oral announcements, as I mentioned to documents, to websites, to forms, to Irish in the courts, you know, various aspects of the legislation. The majority of the complaints come from Dublin, roughly in between 30 and 40%, uh, around one in five, one in four of the complaints come from uh, the Gaeltacht. And those figures are roughly keeping with uh, the census as well, where, where Irish speakers are located. Right. There's a question, or actually I try and combine two questions together. One relates to the Gaeltacht and one relates to um, Irish speakers outside the Gaeltacht. Uh, how do you rate the current trend that even within the most vibrant Gaeltacht, small schools that have been working hard to keep the language alive among the youngest generation, post offices and other institutions of local infrastructure are closing down? Uh, should more emphasis be put on the survival of these communities? So obviously the Gael Tukti, but coming from a different perspective there, uh, the spirit of the Gael Tuk civil rights movement, what do you make of Desmond Fennell's memories of those days of opposing what he saw as the Dublin-centred movement, that to their emphasis on Changa, we opposed our emphasis on Pubble, so language rather than community. So in other words, uh, it may be a surprise to a lot of people on the outside, but as, uh, uh, the Irish speaking community is not a monolith. So many different, and uh, that, that is a surprise to many people outside uh, the Irish speaking <clears throat> community. Anyhow. So um, as regards communities, yeah. So in, in Ireland at the moment, there's, there's uh, and I'm sure it's the same worldwide, but there's a lot of uh, discussion and talk about rural communities and the viability of rural communities. And there was a story recently about post offices closing. And the Gaeltacht, so the Gaeltacht communities in Ireland are, uh, are rural communities, basically. They're along the West Coast, Donegal, Mayo, Galway, Kerry, Cork, and Waterford and uh, County Meath. They're, they're mainly coastal and they're all rural and isolated. So when, when, our, when rural Ireland is is suffering uh great communities are likely to be suffering as well For my area of whether my area of suppose work isn't whether a post office should be there or not my area of work is if it's there it should it should be providing a service uh through irish that's that's where i come into the uh occasion uh, into the situation and again um without harking back to the language scheme system, you know, when I started this job, we were receiving complaints about people not being able to get proper services through Irish from on post, the post office service. And I was amazed, you know, that, um, you know, that they had no language scheme agreed at the time either. So any obligation they had basically related to direct obligations under the act. Um, 
So it's it 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 you know it does show that it does show I suppose just that disconnect between what the state says and what it's what it actually provides a lot of the time uh, in Guelph's communities. As regards the the civil rights movement, you know it's such a so in Ireland there was the, the Guelph civil rights movement, um, and it's it, 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 it's 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 an emotional issue really, or for a lot of people in the Guelph when they when they see what. Um, People fought for and had to fight for at the time, and there, you know, I, I don't see um, uh, in regards to Desmond Fennell memories, <clears throat> the, the the issue of language as opposed to the emphasis on pobble or people. You you know, it, it, like language language is people in 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 my view. So state services are people. So when I talk about language legislation for Gaeltacht areas, I'm talking about nurses and doctors and teachers and postmistresses and postmasters and civil servants. And, you know, that's what I'm talking about. And in my uh, experience, you know, that they're, they're, they're completely interlinked. I don't I don't see uh, a, a divide there. One of the interesting areas is this idea of an international network of language commissioners. And uh, where, so how is Ireland sort of seen within that in the context of, uh, of language policy? But there's also another element that it tip, links in with one of the questions, the other jurisdiction on the island of Ireland and the talk of a lang Irish language act. Have you been approached, for example, to provide input or is that or is that just too political in the context of the, uh, of the northern situation? Um, so as we, as regards the international uh, thing, first of all, the, the question about how we relate internationally, um, I think uh, we're we're doing well. Um, my my predecessor Sean O'Coron was instrumental in the establishment of the International Association of Language Commissioners. Uh, I was president uh, of the organization for uh, a while. I was vice president for a while. Uh, our office provided the secretariat for it. So we do punch well above our weight, I would argue, as regards the international community and how we try to, to play our part in that. What I've noticed of where we stand is that we're a small office compared to other organizations. You know, so in my office, there's eight of us plus myself. Where when I look to Wales, they have uh, 40 or 50. Uh, the official uh, languages commissioner in Canada has over 100, I think. Um, and they have different functions as regards promoting the use of Irish or promoting the use of languages, which I don't have. You know, my, my role is, is to monitor compliance. But in a general sense, what I do what I do notice is that, you know, we all often have the same challenges as well, no matter what the size or what the obligations are. And that is trying to, by hook or by crook, by carrot or by stick and by whatever means possible, basically trying to get the state to comply with their language obligations. And I suppose, you know, it's good when we manage to meet up online these days that, you know, you never lose sight, basically, of behind complaints. There's a there's a person behind complaint, behind a complaint that someone something is bothering him or her, and that the position you hold ultimately is to be loyal to the legislation, but also, you know, you're there to help um, the people as well, and to the the duty is to. I'm trying to think how to phrase this properly. The duty is to make sure the legislation works as well as it allows you as possible, you know, to push it, I suppose, as much as you can to ensure that um, people who want to get their services in, in the language, you know, can do so and to help them as much as you can. Um, that's a common theme across all offices. As regards Northern Ireland, uh, would you believe uh, the day before lockdown, I was in, in uh, Stormont. Um, delivering a, a lecture on on language rights there, with um, various various speakers, and um, what I spoke about that 
time, and I suppose where I'm comfortable speaking about, because you mentioned the political aspect to it, um, what I spoke about that time basically was what I viewed as being important to the role of a language commissioner. And it came down to one word for me, which was independence. So a language commissioner, and I was basically arguing that when one, uh, when a language commissioner's office is being established, that the most important thing to lay down, to set out, is that the, the office and the holder of the office be independent, that it's vital. So you need to be independent of government. You need to have um, control as much as you can over your budget, over your hiring of staff. Um, you know, all the back office stuff should be independent from central government. And very often that's not there. You know, the, the, uh, in offices. So that's kind of the angle I took for that. We're happy, I'm happy to provide any advice I can at all stages, and I have. And especially through the International Association of Language Commissioners, we did um, write to the uh, government instalment a few years back, outlining our role and our willingness when an office uh, was being established, or if an office was being established, that we were there to offer any advice that, that we could as well. So, and in, in again, just linking in with questions, sort of like with the international aspect, uh, I have a question from Rob Dunbar, obviously kind of the Canadian connection with our, uh, uh, and the model in, in Ireland as regards the Language Commissioner and the Official Languages Act. But of course, Canada is a big country. So you have, for example, Language Commissioner in Ontario as well, so not so much federal, but also looking at, for example, up north with the indigenous languages. One wonders is whether kind of there's they have things to learn from the Irish experience. Yes, uh, yeah. Um, thanks to Rob for the question as well. Rob has been um, a big supporter of the International Association of Language Commissioners, and we had a conference in Galway in 2016, which I organised, and Rob um, came over to to chair a debate on. Uh, a Northern Ireland Language Act at the time. Um, and he's a, you know, a, a leader in, in the field as regards that. As regards what, the, what, what our Canadian brethren can, can learn from us and what we can learn from them. Um, certainly from my point of view, I'm always, you know, what works and what doesn't work for us and how it can trans transfer over to other jurisdictions is, is central to the whole aims of the, the IALC. So from our point of view in Ireland, if I was um, asked for advice by a language commissioner from any jurisdiction about you know, an office and how to run an office, it would be like to be independent, to, to, to speak fearlessly, to... Um, not go down the road of language schemes. We've seen how that doesn't work here. And that ultimately it comes down to people, that if you want to provide services through pe to people through Irish, you have to have people in the system to do that. And that really you're going to be swimming against the tide at all stages. It's going to be very difficult to provide the services you want if you haven't got people. So you need the lofty ideals. It's very important. You need the legislation underpinning that, but underpinning that again, you need to ensure that there's a cohort of people with the language that can provide the services that you want. And also, finally, I think I would say, you know, especially in the Gaeltacht and so on, you know, it's, it's language rights and language legislation is not going to solve uh, a crisis on its own. But what I was trying to get to in the speech is that it's part of the solution. And it incorporates, as I said, people. It incorporates doctors and nurses. And it's, it, it, with the new bill, it, it is an opportunity for the state to say, we recognize there's a problem here. And this is what we're going to do about it. And we're going to lay down a clear commitment in the legislation that if somebody wants a service through Irish in the Gaeltacht, that they're going to get it. And the problem with that is, of course, that the people might be there to provide it, which is where we come back to the recruitment issue as well. Okay, so I think this will be our last question. <coughs> it's a nice simple one there for you, Ronan. Do you study comparable communities such as Catalonia to ask how and why they have fared differently? Why is the carrot slash stick necessary at all 
Perhaps your language of duty slash obligation is an unattractive vocabulary for young people, but there's little sense of why the language matters beyond duty slash obligation, even in your talk today. Your focus was almost entirely top down. I wonder if that is sufficient as a focus. What about say the Catholic church and its hold on education historically? Has that helped given their ambivalence around republicanism, for example? So I say a nice easy question there for you. <laughs> off. Uh, no, I, I'm happy to answer it. And it, it, it's, it's not sufficient to, to focus on a top down and it's not sufficient to focus on just regulations and duties. It's definitely not. But my role, uh, and it's not the first time I've got that question, but my role as language commissioner is to ensure that the legislation is upheld. And I make no apologies whatsoever for it. And I make no, I will talk for 10 hours about duties and regulations and why they should be upheld, because that's my role and that's my job. And there's a lot of talk about language promotion and it's vital and it's important, but there are organizations for that. But I'm here and I'm paid to investigate complaints from the public, to highlight concerns from the public, to be there for people who are trying to get a doctor or a nurse or trying to get a service through Irish and to highlight the difficulties with that. And I've mentioned, you asked me about my complaints, the amount of complaints I get. I've just spoken about half of those complaints I can't investigate. So if I was to come on here and not address those issues, it, would, it wouldn't be right. You know, there are problems, there are severe problems. Um, but underpinning it for me and the reason I do the job is because I believe in legislation. I believe that legislation can have an effect, I can have a positive effect. And one thing I've learned for, about public bodies is that they understand legislation. They understand if there's a duty there, you know, that they, they, there is something that they have to look at and something that they have to see, you know, can it be rectified if the duty is laid down. Before the Official Languages Act, there was a system of voluntary language schemes, which had no statutory basis in Ireland, which were, you know, fantastic. And they promised all sorts of things and never implemented because there was no legislative duty behind them or statutory foot into them. So, you know, from my point of view, my job is, is, is as an ombudsman to investigate complaints. It's an important role. It's a vital role. It's not the only role. Okay, so she didn't go back to Jay Marshen, but I'm so boy has a career go le le run and as a as a hard kind of thing. You know, but I'm so boy has got the gact and a Italian and you want to thank Ronan for 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 his lecture. Of course, also want to thank everybody else who joined in, participated today. Gurmila Magat Ronan, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Gurmila Mahagi. Okay, my who Ronan. So we'll couple of normal dagat and shin oh. mahrumsa to he oh, and yeah. the couple of the LS Jacks uh breakout room shin hakinza. Okay. The exam would just shag a brand new in the chapter. Come out, come out, come out, brand new freeze in this. Oh yeah, the Dini Torch Mach foot of his winning machine test, I guess. Or keep to go in. No, 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 Tashit, 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 Moltoch and Shen. Okay, so tell me how the Asia stopped.